That, that's, a, that's a good idea if you know there's exploitation. But in some cases, you might not find exploitation. Mm -hmm. So the workers might, might be very well treated, have good benefits, good salaries, and really there's no abuse in the company. So it's a well-run company. So it, it, you cannot always find a connection to the workers' benefit. I'll give an example with Veolia, uh, the French company involved in the Jerusalem light rail. When we started the campaign, we started it in, in, uh, in the Basque country, in Bilbao, in Spain. <coughs> and in Spain, there were three unions. <coughs> Veolia had a local business there. And there were three unions representing the Veolia workers. And we met with them, which was you know, a bit courageous of us to meet with the workers' unions working for Veolia, asking them to support our boycott of their company. We explained international law, flip charts, videos, and so on, how you know, immoral their company is. And they were yawning. You know, OK, what's in it for us? We're workers for Veolia. What do you want us to do? So we finally got up and told them, look, you have an interest in the boycott against Veolia. Because unless Veolia is forced to get out of its illegal Israeli business, it will suffer consequences in terms of profits. And guess what companies do when they lose profitability? They lay off workers. So it's in your interest to maintain your job, get Veolia out of Israel. That opened their eyes on it. And the next day, they joined us in a demonstration, the first demonstration ever against Veolia, in the center of Bilbao, and they put stickers, boycott Israel, on all of Veolia buses, the, the unionists. Uh, so sometimes we do find connections with the unionists, with the workers, but sometimes we cannot. Regardless, we have to keep the big picture of, of uh, holding Caterpillar accountable for its crimes is far more important than maintaining the jobs in Caterpillar. That's, that's, there's always this trade-off. This is not equivalent to saying Israel is identical to South Africa. Because apartheid is not South African. I mean, the biggest manifestation of apartheid was clearly South Africa. But South, uh, apartheid is well defined in international law. There's a UN convention uh, for the punishment and suppression of the crime of apartheid, which was passed in 1973 and went into effect 1976. It defines the term apartheid. More recently, the 2002 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, also defines the crime of apartheid. And in both cases, Israel fits the bill perfectly. What Israel is committing against the Palestinians fits the bill of apartheid. It's the crime of apartheid. Why is that? It's not just that Israel is discriminating. So what? All <coughs> countries discriminate. Even the most liberal democratic countries discriminate. But it's discrimination that is institutionalized and legalized. So the US currently, as far as I know, does not have laws that discriminate against certain types of, citizen, of citizens. If you are from a Mexican origin, you're not allowed to work in that area, or you're not allowed to buy a house in this area. If you're black, you can't do this. It's done in reality, but it's not legalized uh, anyway. In Israel, it's legalized. Discrimination is legalized. There are tens of laws that discriminate against the non-Jewish, so-called non-Jewish citizens of the state of Israel, that's the indigenous Palestinians, by law. That's what makes Israel fit the apartheid. Uh, and so I was wondering, maybe one day, but I was wondering what you think about things like that. Oh, tough question. Okay. The question was from the University of Pennsylvania about some actions under <coughs> the rubric of BDS that may verge on illegality, like putting stickers on certain products at a certain shop uh, to express concern about the legality of this product or illegality thereof. Is that okay? Or not? <coughs> In general, in the BDS movement, we push for legitimate means of expression. Uh, we don't ask partners to violate the law. We don't do that. We stick to legal, lawful expressions of solidarity and of pressure. Now, sometimes it's a gray area, whether you're violating the law or not. And sometimes, activists in France, for example, and in Britain, among other places, have argued convincingly that a Grexco, let's say, the Israeli company that exports uh, produce from the settlements, from the colonies, <laughs> Israeli illegal colonies in occupied territories. Now, these are illegal products. They should not be sold any place because they're harvested in illegally occupied territory, Palestinian territory that's occupied by Israel. So they're illegal to start with. So they're saying, by raising awareness, putting a sticker on an illegal product, 
that the supermarket is complicit in selling and telling consumers, watch out, this is an illegal product, is it really illegal to do so? Because the product is so illegal. So it's a gray area of, of not the law, but of citizen law, basically. Citizens, what, they have a term for it, uh, like they have citizen arrest. It's not a real arrest, but you go present an arrest warrant to a war criminal, a suspected war criminal, it's a citizen's arrest. Is it legal or not? I'm, I'm not sure it's legal, but at least it expresses uh, the illegality of the person uh, you, you're uh, doing this to. So there is no clear cut black and white answer. I think it, it depends on the context, but in general, we advocate not to violate the law because we don't like to see BDS activists being arrested. We don't like to see disruptions that violate the law, not just because they violate the law, because they, they uh, alienate many other activists. The point is not just to get hot-headed activists, you know, venting out and feeling good about it, go at home, have a couple of beers, and feeling very good about it. You know, we've done our BDS work for the day. The point is growing the movement, mainstreaming the movement, winning the liberal bystanders, fence-sitters, that's what we want to do. Do we win more supporters for BDS by doing action that's very disruptive? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't think so. But there are some kinds of disruptions, similar to the case, but not product. Uh, in, in cultural voters in the UK, uh, last year, an Israeli uh, music ensemble that represents the state in a way, because it's funded by the state, and it's doing kind of brand Israel, uh, uh, whitewashing Israeli crimes and making Israel look very uh, civil and, and cultured and having, you know, they, they play Beethoven and, you know, the whole bit. So one uh, British uh, Palestine Solidarity Campaign activist is an opera singer. And this was broadcast on BBC Three, the main radio in England, broadcast <coughs> that concert by the Israeli group. So she went in, she stood up in the middle, and she sang in soprano in the occupation. I mean, very musical. And the BBC, we heard the recording. The BBC uh, broadcast said, we, we don't know what's happening, but somebody's singing opera, but it doesn't seem connected with the music they're playing. And I got really thrown off and I did not know what was happening. And it took them like a minute to realize this was a protest. And then they cut off the broadcast. And that was the first time they cut off a live broadcast of any orchestra in the UK. Uh, this was repeated recently with an Israeli Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. Now, along with that the operatic disruption, if you will, there was a, a, a traditional heckling. Okay, end of it, you know, shouting and so on. Our opinion is that, I mean, we defer to partners. They decide what's best for them. But our opinion is, does it really help, the heckling part? If you're doing an opera, if you're singing something so nicely that makes people think, okay, it's disruptive, but, you know, it's really well thought out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really creative. Sometimes, you, you know, you say chapeau, it's wonderful. Uh, so if we have such creative ways of disrupting, why do we need the more traditional disruptive heckling and, and so on? Yes, go ahead and then. Uh, my name is Mary Kuhn, I'm from the Tech University in Massachusetts. First, Can you just speak up, please? The room is very difficult to hear. <laughs> <laughs> First, uh, a plug for the US campaign's blog. We actually have the recording of that opera. So, are you saying why are we playing <coughs> victory? No, my question is what aspects of the campaign helped and what did not help to get yes, the result? That we can take and use okay. against. Just very quickly, briefly, because the, there is no exact kind of thing in the US, it's just in Europe um, and some other countries, but mainly in Europe. The anti aggressive campaign, like the anti Veolia campaign, started in that conference I mentioned in Bilbao, in the Basque Country, November 2008. So this is very recent. I mean, we've had, we're having all these successes in three <coughs> years, less than three years. Uh, when we started that campaign, French activists were the pioneers in the anti aggressive campaign. In, in no time, they formed, after Gaza, after the Israeli assault on Gaza, in 2009, they formed this huge coalition, anti aggressive coalition in France. Huge as in five national parties. You can't dream of that in the US, because you only have two national parties. <laughs> so they have five national parties in that coalition, and 95 NGOs, including the Farmers Union, the second largest farmers union in France. Because the Israelis were dumb. I mean, a Greco wanted to establish a base in south of France, 
competing with French producers of, of agricultural products. And that's stupid. If anyone understands France, you know those farmers' unions are strong. And they, when they bring France to a standstill, they can do it easily. They park their trucks in the middle of highways, France comes to a standstill. So farmers' unions are really strong in France. You don't mess with farmers in France. Like you don't mess with bankers in the US, it's farmers in France. But Israel messed with farmers in France. And they helped us establish this huge coalition against the Grexco, against establishing a base for Grexco, a market base in the south of France. Uh, so that was a, a, a major mistake, a, you know, a strategic mistake for Agrexco. And Agrexco is not any company. The brand Agrexco is, is one of the most important Israeli brands. It has been on, going on for decades, exporting Israeli produce to all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Latin America, the US, and so on. The tactics used by, by our partners, whether in France, in Britain, in Spain, in Italy, were actually uh, remarkably well thought out. Remarkably. I can't think of one tactic that was not helpful. They were all very, very well done. I'll give an example outside of France, Italy. Co-op, which is a cooperative supermarket chain, huge, $16 billion sales a year or something. Uh, Co-op works <coughs> for products, and an Italian activist uh, had demonstrations uh, in front of every supermarket, and then they started pressuring the management directly. Yes. Um, this is kind of two questions, somewhat more than one. One of the main debates we've even have it, been having kind of within our whole BDS movement is kind of the debate of are we boycotting settlements or are we boycotting Israel? Um, and like talking, talking about, talking about kind of like what are the pros and cons of adapting, you know, either or approach and that kind of thing. And then also, <coughs> and then also kind of on top of that, as far as campaigns that can be waged successfully as far as like a monetary view versus campaigns that are being waged to kind of like raise awareness and at least have somebody talking about the issue. Okay, uh, about the first question, a boycott of settlements or a boycott of Israel? There is a, an issue of principles and there is an issue of pragmatic considerations. Mm -hmm. And we have to take both into consideration. On principle, it is Israel that's occupying, it's Israel that's committing the crime of apartheid, it's Israel that's denying Palestinian refugees their right to return. So Israel is the responsible state for those crimes, including the, the colonial settlements. Israel is the state building those colonies and maintaining those colonies. So it's not like the colonies have come down from Mars or from the sky and they are responsible for their own selves. The colonies, the Israeli colonies, Jewish-only colonies in the occupied territories are the creation of the state of Israel. When somebody does something bad, you don't punish the act, you punish the person, right? I mean, this is basic in law. And in international law, you punish the state. When a state commits a crime, you don't punish the crime, I mean, it doesn't make sense. You punish the state that's committing the crime. It is accountable for that crime. Only when it comes to Israel does this issue come up. Only in the Israeli case. No one ever said we should boycott Sudanese products in Darfur because of what Sudan, what crime Sudan is committing in Darfur. No, I mean, yeah, you all laugh because it's laughable. I mean, how could you boycott Sudanese products in Darfur? Or boycotting Chinese products in Tibet. You know, only Chinese products in Tibet because we're not objecting to China because we're not de delegitimizing China. And we don't want to end the existence of China. We just want to end the existence of the Chinese occupation. It's laughable to use this language. Only in Israel's case, it's not laughable. It's very serious. And it's debated by big professors in your university that, oh, anyone point for political visitors is these campaigns are excellent campaigns, so long as we don't lose track of the entire vision and we don't give in to the, to the uh, garbage that a boycott of Israel is on principle wrong. It's absolutely right. It's categorically right. It's completely the, the right thing to do. And we want to reach that stage where everything Israeli is boycotted. Every institution in Israel, every product in Israel that's complicit in Israel's occupation and apartheid is boycotted. And every institution that's complicit in maintaining those crimes is boycotted be it an international institution, an Arab institution, <coughs> whatever, any institution complicit in Israeli crimes should be boycotted. And that's the ultimate goal, as in the South African case. But it makes sense to start small and grow your campaign. 
Uh, on the other part, the kind of strategic um, kind of awareness raising versus the actual okay. Debt, that's it. The same with, with, with uh, what I said before. We defer to our partners to decide what best to target and how to go about it. So in some cases, you might think we have absolutely zero awareness in this little town in the middle of nowhere in the US where no one knows what Israel is or what it does. It doesn't make sense to you know, suddenly carry a banner, let's boycott Israel. Wait, what's going on? What did Israel do wrong? So there's no awareness. So it makes sense to start with a, a BDS campaign that focuses on raising awareness, because that's what's needed in that particular context. Once we have enough awareness and we want to move on to some action, more radical action, then that's the right thing to do. So activists in every context decide what's best for them, but we have to be aware of one thing. Sometimes some activists with Zionist uh, uh, loyalties, more or less, push for raising awareness as opposed to action. That we should be aware of. <coughs> so some people will tell you, we're not ready for BDS. Let's raise awareness about the occupation and Palestinian rights first. So let's spend the next 55 years raising awareness <laughs> so that everyone is aware. And then, once everyone is aware, we push for solid BDS, which is a very smart way of saying paralysis. Let's not do anything. Our experience has been the best awareness raising campaigns have been very active BDS campaigns. People learn much, much more in action not just sitting in a panel discussion and learning from a speaker passively where you receive his or her wisdom and you take it home and sleep on it. The best educational tools have been BDS actions, where communities organize to work at a specific institution, to, to target Caterpillar, to target Ahaba, to target uh, Elbit, to target any specific Israeli company. They do the research, they share the information, they publicize it, they get the media. The awareness raised in those campaigns is far beyond anything we can do in years of teachings and seminars and panels. Really, one solid campaign of BDS uh, can help us raise awareness tremendously, many, many, many times more than a number of panels. Yeah? I just think part of this question was, um, like, when you're strategizing about a campaign, um, what's the difference or how do you sort of focus on uh, targets that will produce a kind of material effect mm -hmm. against the occupation or a symbolic victory, I think was also part of the... But, yeah, that, but how, how can we decide? It depends on every case. It depends on every case. As I said, if, if you have enough awareness, then let's go for something that has economic impact. Or political impact. It's not always economic, because it one leads to another. For example, cultural boycott has absolutely no economic impact, somebody might say. Why are we boycotting the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra? Why should anyone spend their energy boycotting a music ensemble? Which is a cultural ambassador of Israel, mind you, and yeah, they do brand Israel stuff and whitewash Israeli crimes at a later stage. And it is connected to the academic, to the cultural, to all these other boycotts. In the Israeli case, actually, academic boycott would be the most effective, by far, more than anything else. An academic and cultural boycott <coughs> are the most effective because the brand Israel that it's the only democracy in the Middle East, the only enlightened, liberal, you know, all that garbage that you've been fed in your universities and schools and, and, and churches and so on for decades, that brand is mainly maintained through Israeli academia and through cultural ambassadors of the state of Israel. So the academic and cultural boycott hits that right at its core, that image of Israel, uh, that false image, and it exposes Israel for what it is a colonial apartheid state. And that's extremely important. So sometimes you might focus on something that has absolutely no economic impact, but it will in the future. Hurting the brand Israel affects Israel eventually, economically. Because then people say, Israel has a bad name, I'm not going to buy Israeli tomatoes, eventually. So it starts with an Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra being bad, and then it goes to the tomatoes. And, and uh, peppers and whatever else Israel says in this country. Uh, so that to, impact, to have an economic impact, you have to hurt the brand. And Israel is very aware of that. In 2005, it wasn't for nothing that they started the Brand Israel campaign with pilots in Toronto and then in New York and then the Bay Area and LA and, and other places. The Brand Israel campaign basically said that since Israel, they did research and they found that Israel is associated with religion, 
conflict, terrorism, fanaticism, you know, all these bloody things that no one wants to get associated with. And they wanted to associate the name Israel with culture, high tech, nanotechnology, uh, 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 gay tourism, pink washing, and so on. So many other areas just to make Israel look good for a typical liberal Western public. So they, they pumped millions into this campaign of branding Israel. And this is why we're very aware of this, that we have to hurt the brand. They know and we know that hurting the brand is everything. In the South African case, it was oranges, it was a certain wine, it was certain products from South Africa that undid the South African image in the West. So it started with just boycotting oranges from South Africa and eventually led to, to making the whole brand of South Africa, apartheid South Africa, toxic. So no one wants to touch it. Israel knows we and they are going down that path. They know very well. We're all aware of this. So the brand Israel campaign is very important to counter. Can you talk a little more about um, academic work, like on a campus level, what would, what would a student group ideally do to academic work? Academic boycott um, is clearly the most difficult part of EDS, but I argue probably the most important aspect of EDS, ultimately. Because what sports was in South Africa is the academy in Israel. Uh, South Africans, the white South Africans, uh, the, the oppressive community saw sports as the most important part of their identity. So when the Commonwealth finally threw South Africa out and they could no longer compete, what was life worth if you can't do rugby? You know, and that's it, that's the end of life as they know it. So that got many more South African whites involved in questioning apartheid just because their team could not go to New Zealand, Australia, Canada, or Britain to compete. That it killed them that they could not compete in those commonwealth, and then the Olympics, and so on. So this, the sports angle was extremely, extremely important in South Africa. To Israel, it's the academy. Israel, the academy is one of the main pillars of the system of oppression in Israel. Unlike any other country, it's a main pillar of the system of oppression in planning, in implementing, in justifying, and whitewashing oppression. The Israeli academy is a key partner in the system of oppression. I'll just give a couple of examples, and then I'll move to answer your question. What can be done? How, how can we implement the Kedem boycott? In, in the war, Israeli war on Gaza, the aggression against Gaza, uh, with the massacres committed there, uh, the UN, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all came up with reports accusing Israel of committing disproportionate force, using disproportionate force. Now, the disproportionate force is the <coughs> name of the doctrine developed in Israel, the army doctrine, used in the war on Gaza. That's what they called it, the doctrine of disproportionate force. So it's not, it wasn't like a coincidence that it caused this disproportionate force. And this doctrine was developed at Tel Aviv University through workshops with leading military experts, academics, uh, military industry, and government. They developed the, the doctrine of disproportionate force, which says, since Israel cannot effectively combat irregular resistance forces, like Hezbollah and, and so on, the most effective way is to uh, damage infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, and punish the civilians so harshly that they will do Israel's bidding and beg the resistance to stop. So punish the civilians, they pressure the resistance, and that's how we stop the resistance, because we cannot stop it on our own. That's the Israeli thinking. The other name for that uh, doctrine is the Dahia doctrine, referring to the southern suburb of Beirut where Israel demolished most of the Dahia, southern suburb of Beirut, because they could not defeat Hezbollah. They thought, you know, by hurting a million Lebanese, they will ask Hezbollah, please stop. It's not worth it. That's how it goes. Now, this very evil, very illegal doctrine that violates every tenet of international law was developed at Tel Aviv University. So Tel Aviv University, it's not just producing papers that justify the occupation. It is producing it is producing the very planning for major war crimes and crimes against humanity are planned in the Israeli academia, are, are, are developed in the Israeli academia. Many of the weapon systems used in Gaza and else, in Lebanon and elsewhere were developed at Tel Aviv, at Tehran <coughs> University, and, and so on. Uh, and I can go on and on about the complicity of the Israeli academy. So it's extremely important, very well justified. Now, how do you go about the practicalities? How do you actually start an academic boycott campaign? That's the most difficult aspect, as I said. 
Because academic boycott is not an individual boycott. It's an institutional boycott. <coughs> we don't boycott Israeli artists, individuals, or Israeli academics because they're Israeli. We target institutions that are complicit in Israel's occupation, apartheid, and denial of our human rights. That's a very important distinction. Because quite often we get questions from activists, oh, there's this Israeli, nasty Israeli professor being invited to this uh, you know, Harvard Law School. Should we boycott him or her? Well, it depends. If they're just an individual Israeli academic, whether they're nasty or not, we're not, we're not calling for a boycott of individuals. If they represent their institution, they're not coming as an academic, we're affiliated <coughs> to the university, by the university, affiliation is, is not a, a, a crime. But if they're representing their institution, then they're certainly more comfortable, because they're the face of the institution. They're not there on their personal capacity as an individual academic. There's a huge distinction. Most academic work is done on an individual basis. So in a, if an academic participates in a conference, usually he or she is doing that as an academic, individual academic, affiliated with the university. That's not a problem. Nothing in the boycott is a, targets that. But if they're representing their institution, that's a problem. The other thing is that they're not representing their institution, but they have personally been involved in justifying war crimes. Like uh, the, this Israeli Major General, what's her name? Who went, was invited to the Harvard Law School. Uh, she was part of the legal team that justified the war on Gaza. So she's extremely guilty. I mean, as guilty as it gets. So she's an alleged war criminal coming to Harvard to speak about why the war on Gaza was fine, why killing civilians was okay. We tried our best to avoid, but you know, shit happens, as they say. <laughs> I, I mean, th that's basically what, more or less, what she was saying. Um, that is different because this person, as a person, while the boycott guidelines do not call for boycotting a person, common sense calls for boycotting a person. So you can't rely on the PACB guidelines, the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic Cultural Boycott, to boycott that person because we don't call for boycotting individuals, but rely on common sense boycott to comment that individual, to boycott that individual. And another example I always give is, especially in Europe, they say this Israeli, a singer is coming and she's so racist and she's, she's supported the war on Gaza. Uh, should we call for a boycott? I say, according to the back of the guidelines, we can't call for a boycott. But on common sense grounds, yes, go ahead. On your own guidelines. What if an American singer, and I tell them, goes to Spain tomorrow, and just before leaving, he says, all Arabs are monkeys or all blacks are monkeys. And then he goes to Spain to give a concert. The guy is clearly a racist. Possibly most decent people would boycott his or her concert in Spain, right? I mean, on common sense, the guy is racist. Not because some boycott campaign issued some guidelines that say we should boycott him. So there's a common sense boycott that you don't need any campaign to tell you that this person is bad. Uh, so how, how do you go about boycotting the institution? It's very difficult because you have to convince your university, your departments, to boycott Israeli institutions, their counterparts. You can start with, youth ex with student exchange programs. You can lobby against those and work to end all exchange programs. There's been a lot of work at Davis, UC Davis, I think anybody here from Davis can let me know. UC Davis have worked on that. Other UC uh, universities work on, on the exchange program uh, specifically. So it's the softest target in the, in the institutional links between universities that we can work on. Um, cutting relations between departments of your university and their Israeli counterparts is much more difficult, but it has been done silently. No department in the right mind will come out and say we're boycotting Israel because that closes the department the next day. Even in Europe, no one dares. But in effect, they're doing it. There's a silent academic boycott that's going on. And, and Israel is acknowledging that, and we know that. The number of academic conferences being held in Israel has dwindled. The number of international academics, especially of you know, ranking international academics, going to Israel to speak at conferences has gone down drastically down. They realize it and we realize it. So there's a silent boycott of Israel going on. Another aspect of academic boycott is that, convincing academics not to go to any conference in Israel, not to hold conferences in, in Israel, not to go to conferences, just boycott. As an individual academic, boycott the Israeli institution. So don't misunderstand me. Once I say it's institutional, that, that does not mean that only institutions can boycott institutions. No, individuals can boycott institutions as well. So every single academic outside of Israel is urged to boycott 
every Israeli academic institution because they're all complicit. That's usually the easiest thing to do, convincing academics in your university to boycott all Israeli universities, all conferences held in Israel. So once we had the uh, International Geographers Union, I think it was, held a conference in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and there was a lot of action by, by American academics, some progressive Israeli academics, <coughs> to convince geographers around the world not to go to that conference. So that's usually the easiest way of doing a part of academic conference. I was wondering uh, a, a different sort of tactic other than uh, boycotting, but uh, boycotting <coughs> rather than boy or in addition to boycotting uh, an international institution that's uh, complicit in Israeli crimes. Um, what do you think of the uh, possibility of raising litigation against an, an institution if you can meet the burden of proof that your university has is knowingly complicit in uh, in uh, after a long campaign of, of publicizing like uh, demonstrations of the university administration, um, having knowledge and understanding of their like connection to to a caterpillar, for example. That, that would be excellent if you have the resources and the knowledge, and you can prove. Yeah, the burden of proof is usually on you. You have to prove the complicity, and in many cases, it, it, it's not that difficult. With with good research, you can prove the complicity. And it gets much worse than Caterpillar, in, in, in fact, because Caterpillar remains an American company that's complicit in Israeli war crimes. Sometimes your university might be directly involved with Israeli universities, directly committing war crimes. So not so indirectly. I think an, a, a corporation selling a product knowingly that it's being used to commit war crimes, but still selling it, and my university is using that product. It's not like the university is doing anything. But sometimes the university itself is doing something wrong in a joint project with an Israeli university directly involved in war crimes. Uh, so litigation is always an option, but as you know, it's very expensive and very time demanding, and so you need the resources. Uh, in some places, if you have a good chapter of national lawyer skill and they're ready to do pro bono work for you, great, fine, then you can go to court and possibly you can win. And many, many times you might not even reach court because the university would know it's so embarrassing that they will just, you know, quietly kill the project without announcing it. So the University of Arizona, for example, they've been lobbying against uh, Caterpillar and they were thinking of taking it to court and so on, which is great. Oh, you're yeah. from Arizona? Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Gabriel. Oh, you're Gabriel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, there's like... I know names, so I don't know faces. <laughs> there's lawyers, uh, well, the next stage of, because we pretty much like proved like there's enough, I mean, the Amnesty International this last December, like, uh, was authorized by the, the London Secretariat to, co to come over and to testify in front of the whole State yes, Board of Education. And the president is quoted in the paper before that. That's too, too, and you had excellent work. Yeah. And uh, we feel like we, we, we can do it, but the stage now is, is uh, one lawyer has told us it's a stupid idea, don't do it, because uh, if you lose, and we certainly know we'll lose, like it'll be thrown out, um, but like uh, we're thinking like it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's worth it because uh, we wouldn't be the first ones to do it. Our students, uh, according to research that we've done on college activism and, uh, and, uh, and the anti-apartheid movement, uh, a group of students at the University of Ohio like sued their university um, over investments, and it was thrown out on a technicality. But the judge ordered a very good, um, persuasive argument, saying that if an institution is is offered an alternative to to like choose between like a, an evil and a, and a and a less evil or non evil <coughs> company, that they should they should choose the other one. And so it contributed to like uh, education and awareness and mm -hmm. like. Uh, Ag agitation. Yeah, again, I, I would defer to your judgment because you know the scene much better than we do. We always defer to activists on the ground because we, we cannot read the picture as much as you can. But in general, we don't support guaranteed loss causes. It's not a very good thing for the media's campaign to lose anything. Sometimes we lose, but not because of lack of trying or because we knew we were going to lose, but we went, you know, just to prove a point or to get the publicity out of it. We think it's not the best way to get publicity. If we're guaranteed to lose, it's best not to do it. If we have a good chance of success, yes, let's go if the time is right. But if we, get our, we know we lose, our advice, let's not do it. It's not worth it. 
Any loss hurts the entire movement. Israel would love to have any loss anywhere for the BDS movement to trump up that, oh, they're losing, they're not getting anywhere. Of course, they're having a hard time because we're getting many, many successes. I mean, we're not losing many of our battles. In fact, the last couple of years, we've been winning and winning and winning. And they know <coughs> we're on the offensive, they're on the defensive, on every US campus, and Canadian campus, you're, it, they're losing. So let's not give them the pleasure of winning at all. My advice, let's take our sweet time until we can guarantee success. In the meanwhile, we can do a lot more to hurt Caterpillar on campus and to, to pressure administration, to make it really embarrassing for them uh, to continue dealing with Caterpillar. That's my personal advice. Can we actually cut in? We have only about five minutes more, and Omar had wisely suggested that we bring someone in to talk about TIA craft very briefly because it's such a strategic and um, important campaign, especially on campuses. So we have Sydney Levy, who's just about as much of an expert as we can get. So. And, and before Sydney starts, I just want to emphasize that the BDS National Committee has wholeheartedly endorsed the JVP led TIA craft campaign. We think it's a strategic, national campaign that we hope every student group can help with it. So just I want to give that introduction. So hi, my name is Sydney, and you may have heard me before um, in the other room. And I wanted to say a very few things about the IA craft, and maybe we can speak later after this session. And there's a workshop also. Great, great. <laughs> first of all, the first thing that you need to know is that JVP is partnering with the AFSC, and we are going to actually invest some resources in a, in a limited number of campuses to move forward um, the PDS campaigns. They either relate to TIA specifically or, or they relate to some of the target companies that we're looking about. So you may have been discussing here, Caterpillar, um, Yolia, Motorola, etc. So we are actually now in the process of putting together a plan uh, and we are going to be um, opening up um, um, a, 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 a process whereby people will be able to um, to um, to uh, apply and, 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 and work with us and with the AFSC in specific campaigns in your local campuses. Now, what I have to say about campuses and TIACREF is, is probably twofold. You may have heard before in, in, in the previous room. It's that we have had a lot of experience in JVP working with UC Berkeley uh, when they were doing the investment in other campuses. And what I have to say about SJP Berkeley is that they did an amazing work, but it took them more than one year to do their research to find out which companies in UC Berkeley were connected to the occupation. It's very hard to do this research because universities don't want to tell you uh, where do they invest. <coughs> if you work inside of the TIA press campaign, what you have is that the research is already done for you. You do one phone call, or we can help you do it, to find out whether your, comp whether your campus is connected to TIA press. Once you do that connection, your connection to Palestine is already on the spot. So you bypass all their research. Your materials, we already have materials ready for you. And since we have already a list of about over 24,000 people that have signed our petition, it is very likely that we have people in your community that have already signed. So when you join the campaign, we can actually already share with you uh, names of people that have already signed, uh, which are in your local campus. Alternatively, if you're working with professors, um, and you know you have a professor of history or a professor of economics or literature, and they are not sure whether they want to move forward, whether they want to come forward you know, with BDS, what we can do is we can say, okay, you're looking at literature, then we can give you names of professors of literature in other campuses. These are their peers that have already come forward. And you know, like, <laughs> professors are like sheep. They follow their peers, like anybody else. So like, that helps to know that there are people in the same you know, in the same community that have already taken a step forward. The second item that I want to say about this campaign is that there are many, many, many things that you can do in campus in BDS. What we saw in Berkeley is that there was a vote in the student senate. What we saw in Evergreen is that there was a vote of students, so, you know, largely. So, there are, you know, you can go to the Board of Regents. There are many, many things that you can do. These campaigns where you get to a vote are like a high-level campaign where you have to really do a lot of you know, organizing and thinking and, and almost electoral work, etc. When you start doing TIA craft at the most basic level, you, you start at, a, at, an, at an entry level in a campaign because what you're doing is you're collecting signatures, you're educating people in your community, and as you collect signatures, you are basically mapping out <coughs> who in your community, who in your campus community is with you. And that helps to start with that map. 
it's not a map of only who is with you now, but you're growing the number of people that are with you. And that may be a launching pad, so for let's say the next year or in the next iteration, to use that map to have a campaign that's more like an electoral campaign, either with the student senate or the board of regents or something else. Because at the, at the most basic moment where you're just collecting signatures and educating, you're going one by one and you're convincing people one by one, and so that's how you're building your map in your campus. So those are the two things that I can offer. We have a lot of resources that you know we can talk individually, every campus is different, and that's what I'm going to So um, unfortunately, we're just a minute or two away, and I want to give Omar a chance to maybe uh, close here. Um, but I do want to say that there is, um, what? There's, There's a, a question, question online? Yeah. Oh, well, we got to take that, so we'll do yes. that at the very end. But, um, uh, but I just wanted to mention that TIA Prep is um, doing a workshop. Um, that Sydney that is doing a workshop tomorrow, I think. So he'll be he'll be fleshing out a lot of what we just talked about. Um, so uh, Andrew, it's actually the... for Sydney. Oh. Uh, and the okay. question the question is, uh, how do us as students really promote signatures for TIA Cref when a majority of people on campus, students, aren't affiliated? With The students do not be. The students are not affiliated with TIA Craft. Usually, it's the professors and the staff that are affiliated because those are the ones that have retirement. But the staff pays attention. Sorry. The the, the staff and the and the professors pay attention to what the students do. And what we have seen, for example, even this last week in Detroit, is that a professor sign because students ask. Um, that's that's um, um that's that's number one. And um, uh, I'm going to say something else, but it's escaping me at this moment, um, about Scalian uh, signatures. Uh, it will occur to me in a second, I'm sorry. But uh, you, do not need to, you do not need to have the IACREF to be involved in this campaign. If your campus is involved, um, then you are basically, you as a student are helping organize the, 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 the teachers, the professors, you know, that, that community.